Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Gone in minutes, a car is stolen from a home in Dearborn. Wait until you see how thieves got inside. Plus, a Metro Detroit school is a site of a large COVID outbreak. What officials are doing to stop it. But first, a murder investigation unsolved for decades, and now police are asking for new tips to solve a very cold case in Troy. Topping our news tonight at 6, police are revisiting the case of a mother who was beaten to death while alone in her apartment 42 years ago. The body of 48-year-old Gail Webster was discovered by police on October 28th, 1978. Police believe someone took an object and beat her in the head. Well, now investigators are calling for help from the community. Local 4 defender Sean Lay joins us live in Royal Oak. That's where Gail Webster worked at a restaurant. Uh, Sean, she was very popular with her customers. And that's the key to all of this tonight, Kimberly, jogging people's memories. We're live here along Woodward in Royal Oak because that's where Gail worked at the old Susie Q's. Many of you will remember that restaurant. And this is also all about one police officer in Troy who is now using social uh, media and her skills with that to jog people's memories to give this case the boost it needs. With close to 20,000 followers, the Troy Police Department Twitter page is popular. The page blowing up when the department adopted a kitten, naming it Officer Donut. The officer behind all the tweets is Sergeant Megan Lehman. And that was the view from the apartment. Lehman was working the front desk when she was a rookie years ago when someone came in to ask about a cold case murder. That was the first I had ever heard of it. It was the unsolved murder of Gail Webster, October 28, 1978. Webster was found beaten to death in her Troy apartment. Every investigator on the case has long retired, and the case faded into obscurity. With the case ice cold, Layman sees each day how social media continues to be hot. Layman got the okay to reopen the Webster case and is putting all sorts of curious clues she's finding in the old reports on Twitter because you never know who you might reach. There's a lot of people out there interested in like cold cases and trying to help solve things if we can take advantage of that and do something good for the family for the community and solve this case that's the ultimate goal even if we just get some tips just a piece of the puzzle that help us we already have a lot of information we have a lot of evidence from the 70s could just be one piece of the puzzle we're looking for Back here live. Very interesting way to reopen this 42 year old murder mystery here. And yes, uh, Sergeant Lehman did have to get permission and make that phone call to Gail uh, Webster's daughters to say that she wanted to do this. The daughters are all for it. They say, go for it. You can see now uh, the tweets that she is now putting out and some of the clues that she is putting out. In fact, the daughters will gather uh, from different parts of Michigan in the country this week, guys, uh, to speak to the media about this. Uh, they're hoping for good things. They're hoping something can come of this once and for all. We'll hear from them later this later this week. All right, Sean, we look forward to it. We appreciate it. Detroit schools and the Detroit Federation of Teachers have agreed to a new contract today. The contract includes increased salaries for current teachers and a higher starting teacher salary. New district teachers will start with an average salary of more than $51,000 a year. That's the highest starting salary for teachers in the state. This contract is only a year long due to the uncertainty of district funding. All right, let's uh, check in on the weather. Yeah, Ben Bailey joins us with a first look at tonight's forecast. Hi, Ben. Hey, Kim and Devin. Yeah, we still have some uh, windows open weather to get through here this week as we started out on the cool side of things in the month, but now we're starting to tack on a few more degrees. In fact, we're really about 10 degrees above where we were yesterday, 69 in Detroit right now, 68 in Saginaw. Temperatures are even warmer on the other side of the lake, and we'll get there, but compared to yesterday, 11 degrees warmer here in Detroit, so making some good progress. Uh, compared to where we've started the month of October. Rain coming in north tonight going into tomorrow morning. We'll look at the timing of that coming up. The above normal temperatures are going to last through the forecast, especially as we get into the weekend, but the rain chances are going to come back as we get into next week. And of course, we are keeping our eyes on Delta. When we left you last night at 11, uh, this thing was just a Cat 1 storm. It is now a Category 4 storm, and it's headed towards the U.S. We'll have more on its track coming up here in a few minutes, guys. Okay, Ben, well, let's turn now to the latest on the coronavirus here in Michigan. The state reports 903 new cases, 
with 22 deaths of the virus being reported in the last 24 hours. Meanwhile, the Michigan High School Athletics Association will allow more fans at sporting events beginning immediately. Crowds of up to 500 are allowed for indoor events, while a maximum of 1,000 spectators can attend outdoor events. Face coverings and social distancing are required at all events. Now, meanwhile, Governor Whitmer is speaking publicly for the first time since the state Supreme Court ruling that struck down her emergency orders last week. The governor says everyone should still take the threat of COVID-19 seriously. It is a, a threat to our lives and none of us should take this for granted. If the most protected person in the country can get COVID-19, every one of us can get COVID-19. And this, this, this piece of cloth that I wear on my face is the best tool that we have right now to keep ourselves, our families, and one another safe. Governor Whitmer went on to say she believes more or emergency orders for the state will be issued in the coming days. New York Times reports top White House officials have blocked stricter federal guidelines proposed for the emergency authorization of any coronavirus vaccine. But that is not the end of the story. Our Dr. Frank McGeorge is here to explain how the FDA is working to make sure any vaccine would still meet or exceed their standards for safety. Doc? Yeah, Devin, the sticking point in the proposed guidelines is likely a provision that would require volunteers to be followed for a median of two months after they receive their second dose of the vaccine. That requirement would essentially guarantee no vaccine could be authorized before Election Day. We've made it clear that we want to see a median of about two months of follow up uh, for uh, any of the vaccines that comes in. Speaking yesterday on the JAMA network, Dr. Peter Marks spelled out the criteria the FDA will require of any potential coronavirus vaccine. Marks is the director of the FDA center that will ultimately authorize or reject a vaccine. Safety is what keeps me up at night uh, because all we need is, uh, is something happening with vaccine safety to create a real problem here because the way we're going to get over COVID-19 is if we get a vaccine that has 70 or 80 percent efficacy and we can deploy that to 78 or 80 percent of the population, we actually have a chance of having herd immunity. Some vaccine makers, including Johnson & Johnson, have already publicly committed to following the two-month guideline. The stricter standards also require that there be at least five severe cases of COVID in the group that received the placebo as evidence that the vaccine is truly effective. The American public has put their trust in us that we're going to make sure that this vaccine, whatever comes through us, is going to be a quality vaccine that's safe and effective. And the devotion I've seen to making sure that's what happens, I think, has helped us all kind of keep our hands over our ears to the noise uh, that's coming in from all sides and keep our eyes on the prize. Now, Dr. Marks says it will take weeks to evaluate vaccine data before an emergency use authorization would be granted, pushing the timeline for a vaccine closer to the end of the year. Now, vaccine makers will also be required to continue following volunteers and monitoring the vaccine for long-term safety, even after any rollout. So oh, there is a vaccine, then it could, I guess, still potentially meet those requirements, right? Well, yeah, Devin, you know, Pfizer's CEO has repeatedly predicted that they could have an answer about whether the vaccine is effective by the end of October, but whether they would have accumulated enough data to actually submit an application to the FDA, that's another matter yeah. entirely. Yeah, we'll stay on it. All right, Doc. Now, coming up tomorrow morning, one of the red flags for COVID-19, uh, we've talked a lot about the loss of smell and taste. And tomorrow at 6.30 a.m., why this symptom may be more important than doctors even first realized and what you should do right away if you should develop it. Yesterday, the state reported 24 new school-related outbreaks due to the coronavirus. The largest is at Holy Redeemer Grade School in southwest Detroit. That's where the school has 11 confirmed cases of the virus. As Victor Williams shows us, school officials are taking action to stop the spread. Well, now we have the letter that went out to parents from the principal explaining the outbreak and what comes next. The letter from Principal Katiri Burby went out to parents of students at Holy Redeemer on Monday revealing yet another student tested positive for COVID-19 and that they will be focusing on distance learning for the rest of the month. 
This now drives the number up to 11 confirmed cases, the first of which was discovered back on September 22nd. Distance learning originally started the following day, but will now be extended even longer because of the latest case. The school reports that everyone is doing well and are at least recovering, but they're still taking the situation very seriously. The Detroit Health Department will be offering the chance for parents to ask any questions about the virus and how it could possibly affect their children with known cases in the building. Today, the Health Department will be at the school answering that. The same will be happening on Thursday from 6 to 7 p.m., but for parents who speak Spanish. The school, however, wants families to be proactive and stay quarantined to their homes as much as possible to prevent further infections from happening in the future. And in order for classes here to return to that in-person traditional style, it's going to have to take 28 days to pass from the last case that was found. Victor Williams, Local 4. Hi, Victor. And Michigan schools are now required to notify the public about any probable or confirmed cases of COVID-19 within 24 hours. That's under a new emergency order. Several neighbors in a Dearborn neighborhood targeted by car thieves over the last couple of months. Latest victim, the owner of a Dodge Challenger, but it's how they got away with the vehicle that's rather shocking. Larry Spruill talked with the car owner who caught everything on camera. So imagine you are inside your house, you're awake, minding your own business when someone is stealing your car. That's exactly what happened to one man here in Dearborn. He says it was all caught on camera, but watching the video makes him wonder how in the world did they do it? We were awake around 1.15 a.m. and um, we were downstairs in the basement doing the laundry. And Amada Saudi says while they were inside on September 28th, these thieves were on the outside trying to break into his white Dodge Challenger. Al Saudi says his car is a push to start and a key fob is needed. He always locks his car doors, takes the key fob with him to keep people from stealing. We seen the car wasn't in the driveway on the camera. We came outside expecting it just to have happened, but when we came outside, there was already cops out here. But how did they do it? They went in through the sunroof. You see them on the video uh, with a screwdriver wedging it open and then they forced it open, both of them. It took them like three minutes to get the sunroof opened. And at one point he was standing in the vehicle covered by the sunroof for at least over a minute. Come to find out he was not the only one. Something like this happened weeks before. Upset, frustrated, you know, this happened two months ago. Um, 11 o'clock at night during Ramadan, another charger that was here about two and a half, three months ago. He says he got his car back, but after the thieves took it on a joy ride and crashed it, now he's forced to start all over again. Reporting in Dearborn, Larry Spruill, Local 4. Okay, Larry, uh, much more to come here on Local 4 News at 6. Uh, here's our business editor, Rob Maloney. It is the most profitable vehicle in the business. General Motors and Ford and FCA are so good at what they do in this segment. And the domestic three are depending heavily on these vehicles. We'll tell you what's happening out here on the car lot.